Okay, well, after we have gotten used to working with numbers a bit, and after the first few proofs that we have seen in the earlier presentations, divisibility is now a fundamental topic that will stay with us for the rest of the course. You can already uh, gather that from the introduction, because the introduction said we're going to talk about prime numbers, and certainly prime numbers are linked to divisibility. Uh, this presentation shouldn't be too bad yet, uh, but nonetheless, of course, the vocabulary as well as the ideas are fundamental. So what's up with divisibility? Well, if you've got two integers, n and d, then we will say that the integer d divides n, or n is divisible by d, if and only if, iff means if and only if, there is a, another integer k, so that n is a multiple of d, namely k times d, right? And if that's the case, we'll also write d divides n. So this vertical dash here, that is, uh, that is pronounced divides. All right. And uh, well, when d is not equal to 1, we will call d a divisor or a factor of n. We typically don't count 1 a factor because 1 is a factor of everything. And it doesn't really, if, OK, 1 divides everything. And so 1 would be a factor of everything. And it wouldn't really tell us anything. So uh, that's what we exclude 1 here as a divisor or as a factor. Uh, related to divisibility, then, is the idea of a prime number. And so if you take a natural number that is not equal to 1, and you call it p, then p is called prime or a prime number if and only if the only numbers that divide p are 1 and p. Just like we have learned, I think, all the way back in elementary school, prime numbers are the ones that are only divided by 1 and by themselves, at least within the integers. Uh, a number that is not called a prime number, or a number that's not a prime number, is then called a composite number, sure. And if we're looking at examples, well, if we just list the first few prime numbers, then we know that 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, and 31 are prime numbers. The next one, I think, would be 37. Uh, so yes, there are more. In fact, there are infinitely many more. And on the other hand, the numbers 4, 6, 8, and it almost looks like it's only the even numbers, but look, 9 is also not a prime number. Uh, 12, 14, 15 is not even. And uh, then we will get more and more odd numbers, such as 21, 25, and 27, as we go deeper into the set of natural numbers. And this really isn't very deep, because we're only going up to 30, but the numbers listed here are not prime. Uh, prime numbers, if you want to try to remember them somehow, at least the smallest ones, prime numbers, of course, only occur in their own multiplication tables, right? A number like 7, for example, does not occur in the multiplication tables for 2, 3, or 5, or 4, or 6, and it also doesn't occur in any other multiplication tables uh, except for the multiplication table for 7. So this is in some ways why instinctively we know that a number like 43 ought to be prime because we never see it in any multiplication tables uh, or haven't seen it in the elementary multiplication tables. Uh, but unfortunately, testing for primality for large numbers is a lot harder than just looking at our elementary multiplication tables and seeing that it does or doesn't occur. And that is why, of course, a large chunk of this course is then also devoted to primality testing. The other thing that we can do now that we have divisibility, we also want to think about what happens when divisibility doesn't work out. And that's, of course, division by remainder. So that is the division algorithm or the long division algorithm that you've also learned in elementary school. And uh, that is a theorem that says if you've got a number in z and a divisor in the natural numbers, then there are unique numbers q for quotient, which could be a natural number or 0 and r for remainder, which could be, which is any number, any whole number between 0 and d minus 1, so that n equals q times d plus r. So that's a theorem, uh, and yet it's called an algorithm, and that is because we are going to see that the proof basically suggests the division algorithm that we have learned in school. Okay, but first of all, of course, we need to prove that this actually works, even though, well, we've, we've done it for quite a while. So, proof. Well, there are two parts to this. On one hand, the theorem says there are the numbers q and r. And on the other hand, it says that there are unique numbers q and r. And typically, when that happens, when you've got a theorem that says that there are 
unique objects, you first typically prove that they exist, and then in a separate part you prove that, in fact, there can be only the ones that we have just derived. So, take a natural number, and we're going to use strong induction on n, because basically if n is a natural number between 0 and d minus 1, so for a natural number or 0 between 0 and d minus 1, well, you use q equals 0 and r equals n, and that's it, right? I mean, that satisfies what the theorem says it should. The induction step, therefore, for the natural numbers, then, is what happens when n is greater or equal than d. And when n is greater or equal than d, well, then n minus d is a natural number or 0. And by induction hypothesis, that means that there are a quotient q tilde, that is a natural number, and a remainder r tilde between 0 and d minus 1, so that n minus d is q tilde d plus r tilde, right? And that's because for n minus d we can use the induction hypothesis. Of course, that means I can now simply push the d that is subtracted over to the right and realize that n is q tilde plus 1 times d plus r tilde. And so that means if I use q equals q tilde plus 1 and r equals r tilde, I have the result for this new natural number. And so that means that we have existence of this uh, quotient and remainder for natural numbers greater or equal than zero. For integers, remember this is about n being an integer, not just being a natural number. So for n smaller than zero, what can we do? Well, we can find q tilde and r tilde so that the division works out for negative n, right? So negative n is q tilde d plus r tilde because negative n is greater than zero. Now, of course, we can push the negative sign over, so that means that n is equal to negative q tilde d minus r tilde, and that sort of looks like what we have here, except that we've got a minus sign here, right? And the theorem said it's supposed to be plus r, not minus r. And so we have to get rid of this r tilde somehow, turn that into a plus r that is also in the right range. Uh, there is a very simple step, first of all, because if r tilde is equal to 0, then we just use q equals negative q tilde and r equals 0, and we are done. And if r is not equal to 0, well, then basically if I take this r tilde and add a d to it, I'll be okay. So if I add d to r tilde, well, I can't just add it on the other side because I'm looking for a division for n and not for n plus d. And so what I do is I add the d and I subtract it in the same breath. And so, basically, when I do that, I work with uh, negative q tilde minus 1, right? That gives me, when I multiply it out, a negative, r, negative d. And if I add that d to the r tilde, then I get this quotient and this remainder. And that gives existence for this, um, uh, for this division with remainder for numbers that are smaller than zero. Okay, so that gives existence. Well, now we have to think about um, um, uniqueness, and that will also conclude the proofs for uniqueness. Basically, whenever you want to prove that something is unique, you typically just assume that there is two of them, and you show that they must be the same. So let's take n to be any of those numbers, and let's say that we have two divisions of remainder, with remainder 1 being qd plus r and another being q hat d plus r hat. And without loss of generality, this is one of those uh, math abbreviations again, without loss of generality, we can suppose that r is smaller or equal than r tilde because after all one of these two has to be smaller or equal than the other. Uh, one of these two r and r, r hat. And so that means that we might as well say that r is smaller or equal than r hat, otherwise we just rename. And, uh, well, when that happens, I can certainly solve for qd, and I realize that qd is q hat d plus r hat minus r. Uh, but that now means you can see now this left-hand side is divisible by q, right? And so if now r was not equal to r hat, well, then r is smaller than r hat. And because qd is q hat d plus r hat minus r, we conclude that r hat minus r is on one hand a number between 1 and d minus 1 because they are not equal and r hat is smaller than r, so it's going to be smaller than r hat and greater than 0. But that number 
is divisible by d, because after all, qd is divisible by d, q hat d is divisible by d, and that leaves only one choice for r hat minus r, and that is that would also have to be divisible by d. And that's a contradiction, and that means that r must be equal to r hat, but as soon as we've got that r is equal to r hat, we realize that qd is equal to q hat d, and after canceling the d, we have that q is equal to q hat. And so that means that Q and R are unique because we've just shown that if we had two possibilities, they would actually have to be the same, just with different names. And that's the end of the proof. Okay, now again, this is called the division algorithm, and yet there is, well, there really isn't an algorithm here unless you really look carefully at the existence proof, because what we did in the existence proof was we we subtracted an R and then just did the uh, applied the theorem for uh, a smaller number for this n minus r that we get. And that is basically the idea of the natural division algorithm, even though we make it a little bit more effective. Because how did the division algorithm works? Well, if we want to compute the quotient and remainder that are obtained when 7147 uh, is divided by 23, so I try to make it work out a division here that isn't totally trivial, well, we set it up, right? We take our numerator and we take our proposed divisor. And now we know that 23 goes 3 times into 71, right? That's how we talk that through. And then we have 3 times 23, which is 69. We subtract that off. And uh, that gives us a 2 as a result. We bring down the 4. 23 goes once into 24. We have to subtract 1 times 23, which leaves us a 1. We bring down the 7, that's a 17, and 23 goes 0 times into 17, so we subtract 0, and the remainder is 17. Okay, great, you could have done that in elementary school. Hopefully you did something like that in elementary school. What does that have to do with the division algorithm? Because after all, we don't subtract off of 7147, we're actually subtracting off of 71. Well, not so fast. First of all, Let's realize that the quotient is 310 and the remainder is 17. And that would then mean that we can write 7147 as 310 times 23 plus 17. And if you work out the right-hand side with a multiplication and an addition as a double check, you really do get that that's the left-hand side. Okay, so that would solve the example. However, we actually, even in this division algorithm that we have learned in school, we actually are queuing off of the number 7147 it's just we're doing it in a slightly more um, slightly faster way than with the regular division algorithm in the regular division algorithm we in the proof we would have subtracted 23 and it would have taken forever because we would have subtracted 23 310 times what we do here with the 69 actually because of the way place value works we actually subtract 6900 right so we're subtracting 300 times 23. And then when we bring down the 4, what we actually are doing is we're doing the subtraction of 6,900 off of 7,147. And we actually end up, of course, here with 2,247. Uh, and uh, the subtraction of the 23, because of the way place value works, actually is a subtraction of 230. We end up with 17. So the division algorithm that you have learned in school, that we all have learned in school, actually is pretty much a faster version of this proof. And I might as well conclude here with a quick story for um, a graphics inclusion routine for my books. I actually needed the division algorithm and I couldn't find one for the package that I was working with. So I wrote a really quick and dirty division algorithm. And guess what? It was basically an algorithm that took the numerator and the denominator and kept subtracting the denominator and keeping track of how often the denominator was subtracted until the remainder was so that the next subtraction would give me a negative number. So the division algorithm literally is an algorithm. It works just fine in my graphics inclusion routines and because the numbers aren't getting too big and of course because computers can subtract really fast, it's also fairly quick. Um, don't include, well, not quite sure. I think operating systems do something that is a little bit smarter than this, but offhand, as I'm in mid-presentation, I, I don't think I can pull out of the back of my brain how operating systems do these things. Certainly, ultimately, it will also involve subtractions. I know that. 
Okay, so what can we do? Well, when we have these theorems, we also want to see how they're being applied. And so here is a little example where we look at a real number x and a natural number n, and we want to prove that the greatest integer, the floor of x divided by n, which is a quotient in real numbers, right, is actually the greatest integer below the greatest integer below x divided by n. Okay, so that one verbally is really hard to say. You just have to look at the formula here. How on earth do you prove something like that? Well, basically, whenever you have real numbers and integers involved, you want to split the real number up into its fractional part, which is x minus the greatest integer below the real number. And uh, then, certainly, because we're looking at division by n, we can also find a quotient in z and a remainder between 0 and n minus 1, so that the greatest integer below z is qn plus r. And then we can just compute, because now the greatest integer below x over n, that is the greatest integer below, greatest integer below x plus the fractional part divided by n. And I can now even write this one out with the nq plus r, right? So this is qn plus r plus f divided by n, and we take the greatest integer of that. But now we've got a division that works, right? Because qn over n is q. So this becomes the greatest integer below q plus r plus f divided by n. Now q is an integer. r is a number that is between 0 and n minus 1. And f was a fractional part, so that's less than 1, which means this numerator here is smaller than n. So that means this is actually here's an integer, and here's a fraction between 0 and 1, which means that this expression is q, and that means that this is the greatest integer below q plus r over n, because now this is again integer plus fraction between 0 and 1, and that was of course qn plus r divided by n, greatest integer below that, and that is the greatest integer below x divided by n, greatest integer below that. So here we have another example of a computational proof where we are using meaningful symbol manipulation. We just see this x as a number plus a fraction, fractional part, and then see that number as a result of a division by rem with remainder. Everything else pretty much falls into place, but we first have to see numbers that way. Finally, we're going to talk about greatest common divisors, at least introduce them here, and put in a few disclaimers also. Uh, so if we take two integers, m and n, well, then the greatest common divisor, which will always be denoted parenthesis m comma n parenthesis closes, that greatest common divisor of m and n is the largest natural number d, so that d divides m and d divides n. The least common multiple, which will be bracket m comma n bracket closes, of m and n is the smallest d in the natural numbers, so that m divides d and n divides d. Okay, so I use the same letter d here. Of course, d for divisor works out just fine. I couldn't use m for multiple because m was already used, so I just used d there. And so, for example, the greatest common divisor of 6 and 9 is 3. Yeah, great, because 6 is 2 times 3 and 9 is 3 times 3. And that's just the direct check that we would do there. The least common multiple of 6 and 9 is 18 because it would be 2 times 3 times 3. And so that's also a direct check. And we can already see that, well, we would want to have better methods to compute these things because with small numbers everything is easy and we'll be interested in huge numbers. But we also want to note on a technical note here that we don't even know that the greatest common divisor and the least common multiple of two integers are guaranteed to exist. Now of course we will prove that they exist in a later presentation and so that is the theory part of the whole thing. Uh, and we will do so along with providing an efficient way to compute these two numbers. Uh, we can also talk about what it means when two integers are relatively prime, and they are relatively prime if and only if their greatest common divisor is 1. So if these numbers don't have any common divisors, well then uh, they are called relatively prime. So for example, 22 and 25 are relatively prime, and that is because two is, uh, 22 is 2 times 11, and 25 is 5 times 5. And so that technically at this stage, we, again, if we want to be very, very careful, we couldn't even use the unique prime factorization because 
we have not proved that there is such a unique prime factorization. Again, that is something that we feel instinctively ought to be the case. But as we build number theory from scratch, we will also prove that there is a unique prime factorization. So the technically correct way would be to check all numbers less than 22 to see if they divide both numbers. And that would yield, of course, the same result. The numbers are relatively prime. And what we can see here is that the technically correct approach at this stage is rather clumsy. But then again, that is exactly why we prove theorems. We want to not just be very, very careful in mathematics, even though it is always good to have a theorem that says, yes, it will always work. But we also certainly want to find better ways of dealing with the mathematics. And quite a few times, once we have a proof, we will also run into a, at least ideas for algorithms that will allow us to check whether certain things are true or not. OK, this is your introduction to, to divisibility. Next thing up, we also have seen in this presentation that we have represented numbers in their usual fashion in base 10 arithmetic. We're going to talk about uh, base B arithmetic or just representation of numbers in certain bases in the next presentation. I'll see you then.